Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to this hour of worship. I'm glad that we're able to join together virtually in this way to worship God and to bring God our presence to share together through the Holy Spirit as one body of Christ as we worship God, lift up God in our songs, words, and prayers. As we gather together on this Lord's Day, um, we're mindful that uh, this is a very tough situation for our community, our state, and our nation. And we are blessed to be able to have this time to be renewed and restored in our confidence, in our faith, in our fellowship. So I'm glad you're with me today. Just uh, by way of um, a greeting, I want to uh, invite you to uh, say a silent prayer with me as I pray aloud. Let us pray. Lord God, we give thanks and praise to you for gathering us safely in this way to worship together this morning. We pray, Lord, that uh, in this time that we have together, your spirit would be poured out among us, that we would truly be lifted up and feel your peace and your presence, your joy inside us through your Holy Spirit inside us as we gather now in Jesus' name in this way. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Jesus breaks through with a word of peace just as he did with the disciples when he showed them his scarred palms. Our fears are banished. Our hope is more than restored. We rejoice like they did because the Lord is with us. We rejoice in the peace and the blessings that he brings. And all God's children said, Amen.
Hello, I'm Pastor Nathan, and I'm the associate pastor here at Oakhurst United Methodist Church. It's time once again for our morning offering. I would just remind you that this is a great time to open up your app to the giving page or go to our website to give online and follow the steps on the giving portal there. Or if you're going to give via check, this is a great time to pull out your checkbook and to write out that check to engage in a physical act of giving your offering to God during this prayer time. We have a lot going on here during this time of distancing at Oakhurst United Methodist Church, and we're trying to make sure that one of the things that we do is we get better and better at bringing these worship services to you online, not just for right now during this this time of need, but also so that we can continue on into the future. We have a lot of apportionment giving also going out to care for the church around the world and those who are less fortunate, and we're trying to look after our neighbors. So the act of giving and continuing to give as we are able, the act of following through and tithing what we have been given by God and using God's resources responsibly, it's always the appropriate time to do that. If you are financially struggling during this time, if you've been impacted by the economic toll that this virus and the economic worldwide shutdown seems to be playing on you, please get in contact with the church. We do have some resources that may be able to assist you with some of your needs during this time. Let us join together now in prayer over our offering. Almighty God, we thank you for every single thing that you've given to us. We thank you for the way that you seem to meet our needs and especially the way you meet our needs through others. Lord, we thank you for your body in this world that rises up to meet challenges, that rises up to carry out your will and to spread your kingdom to others and to make sure that all have as they need to have. Lord, in this time we ask that you bless all these gifts, all these givers, everything that is given today, might it be used to your glory. Might we all be consecrated to your good work. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. Give thanks to the risen Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia, give praise to his name. Jesus is Lord of all the earth. He is the King of creation. Alleluia, alleluia, give thanks to the living Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, give praise to his name. Spread the good news o'er all the earth. Jesus has died and has risen. Alleluia, alleluia. Give thanks to the risen Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Give praise to his name. Come, let us praise the living God. Joyfully sing to our Savior. Alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, give praise to his name. Let us join together this morning for a time of prayer and reflection prior to this morning's message from Pastor Tim. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for bringing us to this space virtually where we can feel your presence, where we can hear your word preached. Father, we ask today that everything that we do to worship you would be glorifying to you, that it would be edifying to your body here on earth, that we would be built up to carry on your work, that we would be empowered 
to live in your will. So Lord, this morning we ask that through the word preached, through the scripture read, that we would feel your spirit, that we would feel your presence. Lord, we desire so strongly to be with your your children, with all of our brothers and sisters in the faith. Help us to feel the presence of one another worshiping together today. We ask this all in your name, Lord Jesus, as we pray the prayer together that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, my sermon this morning is entitled, What Came Next? And I'm going to be talking this morning about the disciples and what they were up to in those few uh, days right after the resurrection. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about what comes next for us in this COVID era. Uh, But before I do that, I always like to begin my messages with a time of prayer. And so I want to invite you to bow your heads and pray along silently with me. Let us pray. Lord God, I do thank you for the awesome privilege and responsibility of sharing your word with your congregation this morning. I ask, Lord, that you would be with me, that you would guide, bless, and direct all that I say and all that is heard, that all that I say and all that we hear would be acceptable in your sight, for you are our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So from as early as I can really remember very well, I was always very fascinated by God. My interest in God really started that I can recall at around age five. Uh, My family were staying out at my grandmom's house by the beach. And where we were staying out there, there were a lot of sidewalks that were made out of wood, wooden um, walkways. And there were a lot of... um, nails there, rusty nails. And my mom, being a nurse, was concerned that I was going to step on one of those nails and get tetanus. So she gave me the big talk about tetanus, about the importance of getting a shot if you should step on a nail. And one day I was fishing down by the uh, dock and I got a fish hook, a rusty fish hook, stuck in my leg. And I thought about the whole thing, and I decided I would rather, uh, I felt like it was safer to try to pray about it than get a tetanus shot, that one that my mom had just told me about. So I remember praying intently and asking God to protect me. And within uh, a couple of days, nothing happened, and I asked my mom, if I was to get tetanus, how soon would it, you know, take between when I stepped on that nail and when I came down. And she said, well, about a week. And I knew that uh, time had gone by and I was safe. And so then I began to wonder, uh, was that God that saved me or was that just a coincidence? And so that was really my beginning of uh, wondering about God. And I remember thinking uh, at that same time, if there really is a God, I have to find out who he is and what does he want from me. So really from that time until I was 17, I was searching for proof of the existence of God, to understand the reality of God. I was not wanting to take anything on faith. I had to know for certain that God was real. And I think you may remember that um, I had that experience where my sister was in this terrible car accident. When I was 17, she was 16. And... uh, She suffered 23 skull fractures and was expected to die. And uh, I offered God my life and service if he would allow her to live. And God at that time poured out his Holy Spirit on me. Felt like a bucket of warm water just pouring down over me, washing over me. I knew that that was God and I knew that my sister was going to live, that God had accepted my offer of service to God if uh, if he would let her live. So 
uh, for about five months after that, I was absolutely convinced in faith. I, you know, my, my confidence had been restored. I finally knew that God is really real. But after about four or five months, my confidence, my certainty began to slip a little bit. Questions started to slip in, and I said to myself, well, I know that was God that healed my sister. I know that was God that poured out the Spirit on me, but how do I know? How can I prove that? I need proof again. And so I was searching again, like Gideon putting out the fleece. <laughs> I wanted that extra bit of proof from God. I had to have proof of the reality of God, and it began to really weigh on me because now not only was I looking for just proof of God that I had been looking for for so many years, but now I also had the added weight of having given my life to God in service and uh, <clears throat> having given my life to God in service, wanted to make sure that there really is a God that I'm giving my life to. And so this produced in me a time of great searching, of great doubt, of great questioning, looking for God, looking for God. And when I was 18, a couple of months after I turned 18, I spent about two weeks where every single day I was praying intently, pouring my heart out to God and just asking God, God, if you're real, please give me a sign. God, if you're real, please give me a sign. And one day towards the end of that two weeks, uh, I was blessed that in the middle of uh, the daytime, in a clear blue sky of an October afternoon, uh, God did send me a vision of Jesus Christ. Um, he's right there, about seven feet away from me, standing right there. It was like a window, <clears throat> or more like a doorway opened up, and there was Christ standing there looking at me. And uh, I knew <clears throat> that God had answered my question, you know, if you're real, God, give me a sign, please. But I also knew that God had blessed me twice because my second question would have been immediately, well, then, is Jesus really your son? Because I was raised in church, and I believed he probably was, but I just had those doubts and questions. So I got both my answers at once, and that's really how I became both a Christian and how I became a pastor at the same time. Now, it's really handy to have had a vision of Christ and be a pastor. Um, when we talk about the risen Savior, I know that he is the risen Savior, that he is the eternal living Son of God, because I've seen him with my own eyes. And that really does come in quite handy uh, as a pastor. Uh, but that experience happened when I was 18. And my faith was still growing, my path into ministry to making good on my promise to God that I would serve him for the rest of my life. It took um, quite a long journey to get there. Uh, I had, uh, after I got that vision, I spent about two years just uh, working at odd, low-wage jobs, really going nowhere. Recognized I didn't have the self-discipline that I needed to get through college. I was in the community college at that time and I was getting all B's and D's and just barely getting through because I just couldn't motivate myself. And uh, so it seemed like the best solution to me to get the self-discipline that I needed to join the Marine Corps, which I did. And uh, boy, did they give me the self-discipline that I needed. I came out and I was a uh, straight-A student when I went back to college. And I did uh, go to college, so I had two years of bumming around and, and doing not much while I was in community college, three years in the Marine Corps, and then uh, another, I guess, six years in college, uh, finishing up my bachelor's degree and then getting my master's degree at Duke. And then finally, I was able to uh, begin serving as a United Methodist pastor. So altogether, I spent 13 years searching for the reality of God. Then I spent another 13 years in living life and getting experiences of life and getting the education I needed to finally get my way to serving God. So it was a long path. And what we find when we look at the lives of the apostles 
is that theirs was a long path to ministry as well, a long path to service as well. I think um, we think about the disciples as kind of um, springing from the upper room when Jesus appeared to them uh, in his resurrection and immediately going from there and being world changers. And it really wasn't that way. The um, disciples, when we think of them, we think of them as kind of ordinary guys that maybe that Jesus plucked out of obscurity and, and turned them into the disciples and then the apostles that they became. There's a, a historian from the second century who wrote around 120 AD about the apostles. His name was Pseudo Barnabas. He wrote this. When he, speaking about Jesus, when he chose his own apostles who were to preach the gospel, those he chose were sinners above all sin, so that he might show that he came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So the apostles were just ordinary guys like you and I uh, that had an extraordinary calling, that had an extraordinary set of experiences where God chose them and empowered them and equipped them uh, through their time with Jesus and through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we talk about what happened to the disciples right after the resurrection. It's very interesting to me that all four of the Gospels tell a slightly different story. Um, why is that? How did that happen that we wound up with four different versions of what happened? Well, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the earliest Gospel written was Mark, and that was somewhere around 55 A.D., somewhere around at least uh, 22 to 25 years after, maybe even more uh, after the resurrection. Uh, the other Gospels that followed, um, Matthew around 60 A.D., maybe 65 A.D. The experts are not entirely sure because none of this it was dated when it was written. Uh, and Luke after that and John after that. And so uh, what we have is the the disciples' disciples were the ones that wrote the Gospels. Uh, they wrote them from the memory of the apostles and from their own memories. And uh, let me ask you, when you're thinking back 40 years in your own life of something that happened, how good is your memory thinking back 40 years? Now, in my case, and I think this is probably true for you as well, the big events we remember with great clarity, but the smaller things around those big events Sometimes um, we don't remember with the same degree of clarity. We have maybe even a different idea. I know uh, sometimes Anna and I remember events differently. But the, the key events here, all four of the Gospels agree without any doubt at all. Christ was crucified. Christ was placed in the tomb. On the third day, he rose again, and he appeared alive to his disciples many times. They all agree on those details. But then the other details about uh, when he appeared, where he appeared, um, what he said to whom, those things uh, they have different stories about. Now, the other thing that's interesting, not only did the disciples not pop out of that upper room right after the resurrection as fully formed disciples, as fully formed uh, evangelists and uh, apostles, but they also had disagreements and misunderstandings, miscommunications. I mean, right off the bat, we start with um, Thomas. Uh, we all know him as Doubting Thomas. But think about Thomas. Here's Thomas. He's seen all the miracles of Christ. He's had all the other apostles tell him, look, we saw Jesus with our own eyes. He's raised back to life. Thomas, no, I'm not going to believe it till I see it with my eyes. Now, that's a skeptic. <laughs> he wouldn't believe it. Uh, and uh, I think that probably there were other folks who were very close to the apostles, uh, that the, the 12 were not just hanging around all by themselves. We know that um, later on we hear about 120 in the upper room at Pentecost. Uh, but the uh, apostles are, are having dinner one evening, and uh, Jesus appears to them. And I'm going to read this uh, short passage from Mark's Gospel in the 16th chapter. 
starting in the 14th verse. Jesus appeared to the 11 disciples as they were eating together. He rebuked them for their stubborn unbelief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. And he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. So he rebuked them. Uh, that is, in other words, he reprimanded them. He upbraided them. And other, maybe he yelled at them uh, for their disbelief. Now, according to the, to the other gospels, the only one of the apostles who, excuse me, was struggling with faith at that point was Thomas. And so this is directed not just at Thomas then, but these other uh, close friends and associates of the disciples who were, the, who were probably with Jesus but are not part of that original small group of the 12. Now, you probably remember that when Jesus called the first of his disciples to become followers, his, his disciples, he called Peter and Andrew. And Peter and Andrew were fishermen. They were at their boats at their boat and Jesus said to them follow me and I will make you fishers of men well what's interesting is that uh, after the resurrection the uh, the gospels make it clear that at least some of the apostles are somewhat confused they don't know exactly what they're supposed to be doing and so they're not immediately going out and evangelizing as a matter of fact what the Gospels tell us is that seven of the disciples have gone up to their original jobs as fishermen. Um, Peter uh, says, I'm going fishing, and six guys go with him. And the Gospels tell us that, that is uh, Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and then two others of his disciples who they don't name. And they're all back at fishing, they're fishing all night uh, on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus comes to them in the morning, another resurrection appearance, and he's not mad at them. He tells them, drop your net on the other side of the boat, and they catch a whole bunch of fish, and uh, Peter recognizes that this is a miracle he's seen before. He knows that that's Jesus. He swims in to see Jesus. The rest of them bring the boat in, and Jesus has uh, created a meal for them, um, some folks have called that the breakfast on the beach. He has cooked uh, some food for them. And he tells them, bring some fish. We'll cook those too. And uh, so they have this meal together. And after the meal, uh, Peter and Jesus have this interesting interaction. And I'm going to read uh, this from John's gospel. And I'm going to read uh, chapter 21, verse 15 through 17. This exchange between Jesus and and Peter. Now, you remember that uh, Peter was originally called Simon, and Jesus renames him Peter, which means the rock. It says, on this rock, my church will stand. So here's the dialogue now, and uh, this is from, again, John chapter 21. Peter, Jesus says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Now, Peter was grieved because he said to him three times, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, basically, in this conversation, Jesus is recommissioning not just Peter, but all of them. He's telling them, it's time to quit your day job and start working for me full time. Go back to what I ask you to do to be evangelists and disciples uh, who are now apostles. So here's the interesting thing. When Jesus tells Peter, feed my sheep, take care of my lambs, feed my sheep. Now this is the pastoral role to take care of the flock, 
to, to mind the flock, to feed uh, spiritually the flock. Now, a little bit later on, he appears to all the disciples, all 11. They've gone to a mountain that's not named in the, in the Gospels. It says the mountain where he told them to meet him. And he gives them what we call the Great Commission. And this is found in Matthew chapter 28, uh, verses 19 through 20. And what he tells them is, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I've given you. So go and make disciples. Now, to go and make disciples, that's the job of an evangelist and, a, uh, and of a teacher. So we have from Jesus now two sort of different sets of commandments. He's given the pastoral commandment and he's given the apostolic commandment, the uh, evangelistic commandment. One is to stay and the other is to go. One is to take care of the flock and the other is to increase the flock. <clears throat> and it's interesting to me that uh, we have the same two emphasis in our church as well. Uh, we here at the church, uh, like I think every single Christian church that is worth its weight, um, we are seeking to, to reach out to younger people, to grow the flock, to increase the flock. But there are also a whole bunch of our church leaders that want us to make sure that we keep our focus on feeding the flock and tending the flock, on making sure that the needs uh, spiritually, emotionally, uh, of our congregation that are already here are being met. And so we have this tension, these two jobs, the pastoral role and the evangelistic or apostolic role to take care of the flock and to increase the flock. Of the apostles, about half of them stay around Jerusalem. Between the scriptures uh, uh, the account that are that's found in Acts and the accounts <clears throat> that are found uh, in the history of the church and these early uh, writers writing around 90 to 150 uh, A.D. We learn what happened to all of the apostles. They call that the Christian tradition since it's not in the necessarily in the Bible or specifically in a book of history. But these are just letters or something like that that. Uh, one of the um, early church fathers, they're called, has written. So we learn uh, from this that, not counting Judas, five of the apostles are staying around Jerusalem. They're carrying out the ministry in Jerusalem. And one of the ways that we know about this is uh, when Paul comes back from his missionary journey and he is converting uh, some of the Gentiles to Christianity, the early church leaders and convened by Peter have a council, the Council of Jerusalem, in which they say, yes, Christianity is not just for Jews that we're converting to Christianity, but Christianity is for all people everywhere. Now, you certainly find that uh, in all of Jesus' teachings, but for some reason, uh, the church hasn't quite grasped that until that point. And then at that point, it becomes crystal clear, this is the doctrine of the church uh, that we're going to uh, reach out to everybody. And this happens somewhere around 10 to 12 years after the resurrection. Now, it may be at this point that the other apostles then decide, okay, it's time to get going, and they also join uh, Paul in reaching out to Jews and to other folks around the Mediterranean, primarily around the Mediterranean region uh, in southern Europe, Turkey, uh, the Middle East as well. And so seven of the apostles, according to tradition, wind up going around the Mediterranean region. Uh, one goes to India where he's put to death. Um, all seven of these other apostles uh, are effective in starting churches where they go. But it doesn't take them, it doesn't happen right away. It takes a number of years uh, before they finally are getting out there. And the same thing is true with Peter. We know that Peter is in Jerusalem until at least uh, this return of Paul 
Um, and when Paul is saying, yeah, it's out, I'm going to reach out to the, to the Gentiles. And so, um, so Peter, at some point around this time, or maybe later, uh, then himself becomes a missionary. And the tradition says he goes into what is now modern Turkey and the area of northern Turkey known as Anatolia. Uh, and he is an evangelist there, and eventually he's making his way to Rome, where, uh, according to tradition, he and Paul again hook up, and they really found the Christian church in Rome. And now this is going on probably in the uh, late 50s, early 60s uh, A.D., so we're talking, you know, 25, 30 maybe uh, maybe even more years after the resurrection. And then Emperor Nero has both of them put to death uh, somewhere around 63 AD. We see now that Jesus assigns these two tasks to the early church. So they're both important. They're both tasks that our church should be about as well, taking care of the flock and increasing the flock. So what does this mean to us? in the current day, in our COVID electronic worship era. Well, here's an interesting thing. You may not be aware of this, but the virus has brought about some changes in our church, not just in this way that we're worshiping now, but also in the sense that our outreach has had to move in different ways. When the early church was persecuted, when the Romans tried to squash the church, instead what happened is they just pushed everybody out and they spread Christianity in some sort of like the way a virus spreads perhaps. They pushed everybody out and the disciples were escaping to different places and, and the other Christians were escaping to other places and they were carrying the gospel with them. And so by trying to squash the church, the Romans had the reverse effect of spreading it throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, the um, thing that's going on with us, the virus wants to squash our church in the sense of we can't get together, we can't be together on Sunday morning to worship. And that's discouraging to us, to all of us. Uh, we, we all miss it tremendously. Uh, worship has been a part of my life, you know, for, for many decades um, on Sunday morning. And I, I certainly, of course, miss that. But there has been this silver lining, and that is that our outreach has expanded greatly as a result. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, Stephanie Fergenbaum is the director of our children's ministry. And uh, Stephanie, in all the years that she's been in the job, I don't think we've ever had more than a dozen kids in Sunday school on a Sunday morning. I don't think we have ever had more than seven or nine kids at her wonderful Wednesday uh, program that she does. But now she's doing a midweek Bible study online and she's averaging over 100 views um, every week. I've been the pastor here for 15 years. I've done an Easter sunrise service every single year. I've never had more than 40 people attend the sunrise service in all that time. This year we did it on Facebook Live uh, so far, we've had 291 views of that of that service. Uh, same thing is true for our, the other uh, Easter services. We have never had so many people in attendance as we have had view the services. And the same thing is true for my daily prayer time. I've never had more than you know, two or three people consistently show up for midweek prayer on a regular basis. And uh, my midweek prayer that I'm having every day at uh, 11 o'clock is getting an average of about 100 views, maybe a little bit more than 100 views every single day. Um, and the same kind of numbers are also true for Nathan's uh, Bible study that he's been holding and for his uh, office hours. There's no way he could get 60 people into his office for office hours on a weekday, but he gets 60 views of office hours on Facebook. And so that's the silver lining that our outreach is expanding. We are making inroads into places where we have never done that before. And that's a, a great thing. 
Now, all of us, I know, have heard many, many times that the most important thing, the healthiest thing for us to do, the safest thing for us is to stay at home, to shelter at home, uh, to go out as little as possible, and when we do, to wear our masks when we go out. Uh, so what I'm asking is I'd like to to end this sermon time by asking you to do a couple of things that I know are going to be a blessing to you, which is why I feel confident in asking. The first thing is, you know, don't neglect your spiritual disciplines in this time, your prayer, uh, your Bible reading, um, your other disciplines as well. We can draw strength, great strength and great help, great comfort from God uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this tough time, but only if we turn to God, if we open our hearts to God and our minds to God, and that means prayer, and of course, uh, reading the Word is very, very important as well. When you join the Methodist Church, there are five sort of pillars, five vows that you take as a, as a Methodist, that you'll support the church through your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And those things are, are valuable for us in this time as well. Um, I've already talked about the importance of our prayer time, um, our presence. Well, I want to ask you a couple things about that. Um, as far as the prayer time, as, as I mentioned, I'm having these daily prayers every day at uh, 1130. Set the alarm on your clock, on your watch, to go off at 1125 so that you'll be reminded to pray at 1130. And uh, even if you can't be with us online, uh, if you can pray wherever you are uh, at that time. So we're united in prayer against the virus. Uh, next thing I want to ask is um, that you fa be faithful in attending church through virtual worship uh, to watch our services and let us know uh, that you're being present, if I may ask, by registering your attendance through a comment on uh, Facebook or through uh, our church app. We do have that uh, ability to register your attendance through the app. Uh, I want to ask that, you know, you remain faithful in your giving to the church. And also, you know, our giving uh, transforms our heart. That's why it's good for us to give just as it, prayer transforms our heart. Uh, these are very tough times and it's only going to get tougher for an awful lot of people who are unemployed for the next few months anyway. Uh, it's going to be very tough. And so I want to encourage everybody to be generous in your giving, not just to the church, but also to those uh, who are going to need food support. Um, and there's going to be an awful lot of that going around. So I hope that you'll do that as well. And this is also a way that we can serve. And the last thing is uh, witness. Uh, we are getting an awful lot of views on our Facebook page, which is great. But I want to ask you, if you're watching this service, would you share this service when it's over? Just click the share button and share it onto your Facebook page. Um, in this way, we can increase our outreach. I'd love to see us get 10,000 views of our, of our service on Facebook on a Sunday morning. Uh, in this day and age, it's quite possible to do something like that if we all... Uh, participate. So we can't be together physically, and that is really difficult for all of us, but we can be together spiritually, and we can be together emotionally, and we can draw strength from each other in this way and through our uh, spiritual devotions. And so I want to encourage you uh, to be faithful and to participate in all these different ways. Will you do that? Great. Let's join together for a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to worship spiritually, uh, emotionally, if not physically, uh, through this interesting medium of the Internet. I pray, Lord, your spiritual blessings to be with each person hearing me now, each person praying along silently with me now. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you continue to bless us, help us to be faithful in this tough time to draw strength and courage, inspiration and peace from you 
through your Holy Spirit in us and help us especially to keep our hearts and our minds open to you in this tough time. Thank you, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And I'd like to offer now the benediction as well. Would you bow your heads? Lord, as we go from this time of spiritual worship, we pray, Lord, that your blessings would go with each one of us. Keep us today and throughout this week in your hands. Let your Holy Spirit rest in and on each one of us and continually draw us closer to you that we may draw strength and inspiration from you. Thank you, Lord. All this we pray and thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week or online in worship tomorrow. God bless. Or actually later on today, 1130. See you.